Hello and welcome to episode 95 of the Chills of Well podcast. It's a pleasure today to be joined by, to, to be joined by Diana Lopez, a little bit about her. She's the author of the adult novella, Sophia's Saints, and numerous middle grade novels, including Confetti Girl, Nothing Up My Sleeve, and Lucky Luna, which is over my right shoulder, or both shoulders, there it is. <laughs> her debut p- picture book is now available and is called Sing With Me, the story of Selena Quintanilla, also over my shoulder. She also wrote the novel adaptation for the Disney Pixar film Coco. Diana, Diana re- retired after a 28-year career in education at both the middle school and college. I am totally messing this up. Uh, after a 28-year career in education at both the middle grade and college levels. Her second act day job is helping her husband in his physical therapy clinic. Physical therapy, spelled F-Y-Z-I-C-A-L. I like it. Physical Therapy and Balance Center, located in her hometown of Corpus Christi, Texas, but she still enjoys meeting with students when she visits schools to chat about books and writing. Diana, how are you today? Thanks so much for joining me. Thanks for having me. It's a thrill to be here. <laughs> oh man, well, I, uh, I really enjoyed reading uh, these three books. I know they're not your only ones, um, but I look forward to talking about those and, and your work in general. How did I do on the intro? Is there anything else you'd like to add? I think you did great. Yes. <laughs> All right, I think we'll fill in some of those gaps, right? Right. <laughs> uh, writing for children, which you often do. Uh, I'd love to know what, you know, what you were reading when you were a kid. Um, what was your, I guess, relationship with, with language? Were you a monolingual speaker? Were you bilingual as a kid? Um, what was the, you know, was it a print rich environment? Those type of questions. Well, um, I was a monolingual kid with a you know with a lot of Tex-Mex thrown in um Mm -hmm. that I heard from my family Uh, but I'm from the generation when um Judy Bloom was really popular I I remember my my first um uh book was uh the Mother Goose nursery rhymes book but I also remember receiving uh some Nancy Drew books you know and things like that um I loved uh the Scholastic uh, little catalogs that we would get. Mm -hmm. Um, my, my parents were, they're not avid readers, you know, so we didn't have a whole lot of books in the house, but I do remember that my father, um, invested in an encyclopedia set, the world book of knowledge. Yes. And I absolutely loved the world book of knowledge. And and what I would do is, um, on little pieces of paper, I, I would put a letter of the alphabet, and fold it up and put it in a, a coffee can, old coffee can. And I would just reach in there, whatever letter of the alphabet I picked, that's the volume that I would look through that day. <laughs> so I read a lot. So, so I have this weird, like, um, you know, vision of history. It's a very Cold War uh, mm. era type of history in my head. And, you know, cause that was the kind of stuff that was happening at the time. But mm. um, yeah, so those are the things I, I was exposed to as a kid. <laughs> oh, wow. Now, what if you drew the same letter like two times in a row, like two days in a row? Right. So I didn't read the whole volume. And okay. so what I would do is just kind of like open it up to a page and, you know, and see what the, the story or the topic was on that page and just mm. read that. Um, nice. So I did really like the I really liked the B for butterfly because it had some beautiful pictures. And then they even had. Um, I, I don't even know what letter of the alphabet this was. Maybe it was anatomy or something, but they had those, those kind of like clear pages where you would, you know, peel it, you would see the oh, human yeah. body and then you would see like the muscles. And the, oh, I yeah. love that. I thought that was fascinating. Oh man. That was so cool. So these, these future generations will never know that, right? Man. No, I guess not. <laughs> oh, man. Um. I wonder, you know, uh, you said Judy Bloom, you said Nancy Drew. I wonder as you got a little bit older, what, uh, you know, who really drew your interest, you know, more into like high school, middle school into high school? You know, I was really uh, reading what um, was assigned to me at, in school, you know, so it's, it's a lot of the, I guess what you think of as the, the canon of school mm. literature, you know, I mean, I remember reading Lord of the Flies okay. and, you know, the Shakespeare plays, a separate piece was a, a yes. big one that we read too. And, and um, you know, on my own, I, I was so busy with, um, with my schoolwork and stuff. I believe that I was just reading mostly what they assigned to me at school. Um, you know, and then I, I, when I went to college and I studied literature, it was, it was kind of the same thing. And I, I love books. 
uh, but it was like I had to read. Uh, I only had time to read for my classes uh, and I couldn't wait to graduate because I was like, you know, when I graduate, I can read whatever I want. Mm -hmm. I don't have to worry about writing an essay or, you know, or taking a test or, or anything like that. Right. But um, but yeah, I would say that um, uh, I just read probably what almost everybody else is reading. Um, you know, my nephews who are so much younger than me, you know, my nieces, uh, they're reading a lot of the same books, you know. Mm -hmm which sometimes kind of saddens me because I kind of wish we had moved forward a little bit, but, right. but they, you know, they also, I, I know that uh, they're also reading life of Pi, which is, okay. you know, that's a more contemporary. So mm -hmm. I'm glad to see, you know, some, some newer authors thrown in. <laughs> sure. Now, um, now did you, gr did you grow up Mexican American family? Is that correct? I did. I did. Yeah. I grew up in a Mexican American family. Mm -hmm. Do you do you did you feel like you were represented in what you read? Did did it matter? Like were you able would you have been able to articulate at the time? Do you know what I mean? Like or was that something I could like not. That? I uh, I was not represented at all. Uh I it never occurred to me. You know, when you when you grow up and um you know and as much as I loved books, I never saw myself represented in books, you know. Mm -hmm. So they were kind of a door into another world. Uh, but it's very uh, insidious because what happens mm -hmm. is um, it, it, you have to like have a moment where, where you realize that your life, your environment, your values, your culture are worthy of being in books, you know, mm -hmm. and Walter Dean Myers, you know, you know, he talks a lot about about this, you know, about how how so much of his early reading was British authors and he mm -hmm. never encountered black authors, you know? And um, I find that very sad. I mean, I actually didn't start to encounter uh, other Mexican American writers until after I graduated from college. Mm -hmm. And I studied literature at a school at St. Mary's university, which was a Hispanic serving institution mm -hmm. and never even had exposure there, which was, you know, this would be in the, the late eighties, early nineties. And um, I'm glad to hear that now there's a lot more, you know, um, inclusion in, in mm -hmm. these college classes, but there wasn't when I was there. So I've really had to kind of uh, discover them on my own, you know, um, and what, a lot of what happened was uh, when I, when I started writing, then I just start, I started meeting other writers like me and these other writers like me started to expose me to even more writers <laughs> so yeah. you know uh, but it wasn't in, in a formal setting that I got exposed to to these writers mm. uh, so it really is a mission of mine to make sure that no child grows up without seeing him or herself you know represented in in books you know I want to make sure that those stories are out there um, not to say that we shouldn't be reading those other books but we should just you know widen our reading list make it more inclusive. Wow, beautifully said, yeah. Um, first of all, the great Walter Dean Myers, right? Mm -hmm. Did you ever get a chance to meet him? No, I didn't. <laughs> yeah, 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 great one. Um, but yeah, I mean, what a telling story, the, uh, the, the anecdote about being at, at the Hispanic Serving University, you didn't even get to read those type mm -hmm. of authors. That's, and it wasn't that long ago, right? It wasn't like it was the 1940s mm -hmm. or 30s, like that's, no. that's yeah and the way you describe it as insidious is is uh i knew you were a good writer i knew you were <laughs> you must have a pretty good vocabulary <laughs> but yeah sad but sad but true uh, very well said as you uh as you were exposed by other writers um i love the idea of like the art the community of artists the community of writers mm -hmm. and you know art begets art that type of thing um who who were you exposed to who are some of those authors mexican-american and not who have really who really thrilled you well, you know, um, two, two writers that, that really thrilled me uh, when I was, you know, studying literature and just kind of actually when I started reading on my own, mm -hmm. um, even though they are taught in schools, um, was I, I really loved Willa Cather. I thought okay. she did. What, what I liked about her writing was uh, she did such a good job of making the setting a character of her books, but mm -hmm. she also had these really strong female characters you know and and i really admired that and i liked margaret atwood too and yeah. her characters are so they, they have this kind of rise sense of humor but she's mm -hmm. just 
you know, her, her way of looking at the world, you know, um, I was just really attracted to and, 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 and I mean, they seem like they're, com- they, they are like very different, but you see a lot of similar things in them. And so I uh, really like those two writers and, you know, I've read them a lot and then time moves on and, and I hadn't read a, a Margaret Atwood book in, in quite a while. Hmm. Uh, but then I, I read, um, oh, what's that sci-fi trilogy she has? I can't remember the title right now. I'm really bad with, <laughs> I'm okay. really bad at remembering <laughs> titles. But I read it after, you know, many years of not reading her. And I said, yeah, I still really like her writing. Mm. Um, But I I was very fortunate. I I got my MFA at Texas State University. And about halfway through my journey there, um, they hired Dagoberto Gilb uh, to be one of the professors. And so he was um, my professor and my thesis advisor. Mm. Uh, and I really have to thank him for um, exposing me to a lot of writers that I I, ha- I didn't know, you know, before meeting him. So mm-hmm. uh, he um, he edited an anthology um, called um, Echo en Tejas, uh, a collection of uh, Texas Mexican writers, mm. which I think is just a, a treasure trove of, you know, our voices. And so kudos Adago for opening that door and I, and I use that I use that book in classes that I've taught so hopefully you know spreading it forward and and hopefully those students will become teachers and <laughs> and have that uh you know that that good resource at their hands all right yeah I I was exposed to him in uh in college just in a, in a fiction course his short stories um mm-hmm. the one about the one about Victoria Principal Oh yeah, right? that that's actually an, an essay he wrote. That's a really good essay, an essay isn't exactly, it? Exactly, right. Yeah. <laughs> Great piece. And then uh, I was recently just rereading one that is called I Knew She Was Beautiful about his mother. Oh, okay. And I don't know if you that one. Oh, it was an anthology. It was, it's a beautiful piece, so a really incredible ending and the whole deal. So mm-hmm. oh, that's great. Oh man, so lucky you to have him as yes. your advisor. Man. How about in uh in in c- contemporary times, are you like you know, how much, how much is it about competition amongst, you know, writers of the same genres or how much is it about, you know, really being inspired and really um, sharing work by others in your field who are just really good at what they do? You know, I'm so, I'm so happy to say that uh, I have found the children's writing world to be a very supportive uh, writing world. Mm. I think if you write for children, it, I think you're, you kind of have this childlike heart and you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. And you really are about, uh, you know, giving these young readers uh, something to hold, something to cherish. Mm-hmm. And, and we have a shared mission and the writing community in Texas, the children's writing community, we, we go to these festivals, we go to mm-hmm. visit these schools and we really got, we really have become friends. Um, and so I'm really happy that I don't feel uh, like people are competing with me. I feel mm-hmm. like, you know, we encourage each other. We, um, you know, recommend each other <laughs> to, you yeah. know, uh, to others and, and things like that. Uh, so, you know, just a shout out, you mentioned that you, that you spoke to Ruben de Goyado uh-huh. recently. Yeah. And, and he's a coming writer that I, I'm thrilled to welcoming community. <laughs> That's great. That's great. Um, the, I, was, I was just finding the, uh, the Margaret Atwood just a little aside here but is it is it something about Oryx and Crake or yeah that's it okay. <laughs> that's it <laughs> okay oh so those are really re- those are pretty recent well the last 15 or 17 years or so okay mm-hmm. I got you all right um so as you as you got into high school college especially or after college you know what how did you become a writer I mean were there was there a eureka moment or moments where you were like you know someone told you you, you know you are good at this or you felt like hey I've I can do this thing. I can do this thing and get paid and make people happy. How did that come about? 
I've always loved writing. And for me, uh, the journaling is always been a tool that I've had. Mm. Um, I started journaling when I was really young and it was mostly because I was very shy. And, and a lot of times um, I would, you know, I, I, I couldn't express myself verbally because sometimes I was just, if you told me that I was going to grow up and <laughs> like speak in front of audiences on a regular basis, I would have yeah. said, you're crazy because <laughs> I was really shy. And so writing down, you know, what my experiences were, what my feelings were, uh, I, and my, and I remember reading, uh, this was a book also that was, that, that did a lot for me in my development as a writer is it was the diary of Anne Frank. Mm -hmm. And, um, I remember reading that and she had her diary called Kitty. And, um, right. I thought, wow, you know, this is her friend and, you know, I can have a journal and that can be my friend. That could be who I confide in. And, uh, and so much of my writing was journaling. Um, but, you know, uh, after a while, you kind of tend to just journal about the same thing over and over again. And, you're, you know, mm -hmm. daily life isn't very interesting. You, you basically kind of repeat the same pattern over and over again. Mm -hmm. uh, and so at some point, it was just a very natural progression. I moved from writing like, you know, what was like factual in my life or whatever, you know, what actually mm -hmm. happened to just kind of like going off on tangents. And, you know, I tell young kids, I started writing what I wished had happened or, uh -huh. you know, or I would take a scene from my life that happened that day, but I would start to fictionalize it. You know, like I would, I would be revising the conversation so that, you know, everybody sounded smarter than they really were, you know, and <laughs> that's actually how I started writing fiction. Um, but I didn't, I, I didn't say that I was going to write fiction um, until I, I remember, um, I remember getting married uh, and my husband and I had a, a year long engagement. And, um, and so that whole year was about the wedding, you know, and I remember after the wedding, he said, what are you going to do next? <laughs> and that, and I thought I got to do something, you know, and, mm -hmm. and at that moment I said, you know, I really want to see if I can you know, learn the craft of storytelling. I really do like writing. And that's when I, I formally, I, I made a, a very formal official decision, you know, mm -hmm. that I was going to do this. Um, and I did that by applying to MFA programs, you know, and that's how I got into Texas State. All right. Was there, was there a press conference that day that you announced that you were going to become a writer? No. <laughs> 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 oh, well, the, the world is better for your writing. We're glad that, you, that you've gotten into it. Um, again, Thank you. You know, you know I, I have these three books in back of me, and they're, they're fairly recent. Um, I mean, you've been on a heck of a hot streak for a long time, but, man, these last three, four, five years, wow. Um, tell me a little bit about your, your earliest writings. What was, what was it like to see, you know, your name on the, on the book cover for the first time? Were you somebody who, uh, you know, the first, the first piece came pretty quickly or was it like a, a slog or how, how did that work? I guess it's always a slog, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. My, you know, I think of my first published, my first published anything is actually my novel, Sophia Saints. Wow. And um, that was my thesis when I was in graduate mm -hmm. school. Mm -hmm. So yeah, there was a lot of, there was a lot of slogging. <laughs> <laughs> I think of it as kind of like my learning to write book, you know, mm -hmm. and, and it was just things like, you know, when my character has a flashback and, you know, she was having just like, I was like, well, I need to put this memory in and I would kind of sneak it in. And then I'll be uh, like, wait, and then just kind of learning. Well, that's not how we have, that's not how we have memories. Something triggers a memory, you sure. know, but then also like, you can't stop the action of a story for the character to have a memory because something, you know, and so mm -hmm. it's just like details like that. Like, how do I get my character from point A to point B or, I have a scene and it's like a multi-character scene mm -hmm. and, you know, writing, if you think about, you know, like dialogue in writing, it's very linear, you know, in a screenplay, you know, when you see a film, you can have multiple voices happening at once, mm -hmm. but when you read a book, it's very linear, the dialogue. And, and that was a real challenge for me. Like, how do I create the illusion that uh, all these people are talking at once, you know? Mm -hmm. So there was just like technical, you know, in addition to like, the story taking shape, um, there are all these little technical uh, aspects to writing that I, I needed to figure out. Uh, so that's why I call it my learning to my learning to write book. Uh, but it was my it was my master's thesis, and I was determined like before I was going to 
do the best I could. And before I graduated, I wanted something in my hand that was, you know, ready to take to publishers. And so, um, you know, it took me a while to, to, I could never find an agent for it. They all kept saying it was too short and it is a really short book. Um, and I did find out that that's a thing, <laughs> mm-hmm. you know, I did find out that, you know, there, there's a, it takes as much money to publish a book that's, you know, 250 pages as it does to publish 150 pages, mm-hmm. all these, all these things that you don't think about. But, uh, but I did find a, a, a publishing home in Arte Publico Press okay. there at, um, in Tempe, Arizona, Arizona State University. Mm-hmm. And I do remember when they called uh, on the phone to tell me that they were going to publish my book. Mm. Uh, you know, back then we didn't have, we weren't really using email. <laughs> we were mailing our manuscripts in and people were calling you on the landline. <laughs> and um, I was so excited, you know, I was like, I couldn't eat because I was just mm. too excited that this was going to happen. And like two days later, um, Dagoberto Gilb was having his uh, book release party for Woodcuts of Women. Okay. And I just couldn't wait to go to his book release party and tell him my good news, you know. <laughs> oh, that's great. And uh, it, a lot of my classmates, uh, you know, former classmates were there too. So uh, it, was, it was nice to get to share that. It was very, very exciting. Um, that news <laughs> yeah when when you did the mfa was did you have to do a like a specialty um yeah you had to choose i i uh, if you wanted to do poetry uh i think they had poetry fic, creative nonfiction, and fiction as okay uh, options and i i did the fiction option mm-hmm. but i my 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 little knowledge of mfa i had to think that you were probably one of the few who were writing for younger writers younger younger not readers. at the time you weren't, you weren't sure at the time okay yeah, I actually I didn't start. I actually like after Sophia Saints is not for young readers. Mm-hmm. Um, and then uh, I wrote another novel, the novel that's like in the closet, that's probably never going to go anywhere. <laughs> you know, the one that just I couldn't quite get it to work. Uh-huh. And, um, you know, I spent a lot of time on it. And, and, and I was really, I realized I felt like, like that novel, like I just, like I was working really hard. And it was, mm-hmm. it was like, you talk about the slog, it was definitely a slog. And I, I said, I'm just going to write a short story. Um, and I had this idea of a, of a short story that featured this young girl. And I did write this, the short story. But then I realized, oh, this is a chapter. This is a chapter one of, of a novel. And so that, wow. that became my book, Confetti Girl. You know? And I've okay. actually just never looked back. Um, I've been writing for middle grade. I, I taught middle grade for 10 years. Nice. And so, um, you know, it's really a credit to my past students that I, I found myself into this, into this category of writing, but, but I do write, you know, between books or when I need a break from, you know, the story, I need to kind of re- reset myself. Mm-hmm. Uh, I write short stories and, and almost all of those have been short oh. stories for adult you know, I hate to say adult, do you know, right, short stories, because right, right, right. it sounds kind of seedy, but you know, <laughs> the adult reader, I guess. Of course. So, so you're saying that the, the book that's up in the closet, that the, there's a chapter from that that made it into the book or another one? That would, that book that's in the closet, mm-hmm. I've actually like gone back to and like taken okay. pieces of it and turned them into short stories. <laughs> yeah. 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 I, you know, I have some, some, I think some really good writing exercises I share with my students, pretty much all that I've stolen from great professors and teachers of mine. Um, Mm -hmm. And I'll often say, you know, like, okay, we're writing for, you know, however long, like a paragraph or a page or whatever. If you only get one sentence out of that, it's been a successful time. And I think I mean it. (laughs) So I, I guess if you can see my connection to like the book, I mean, was is it better to have loved and lost with the book? Like that book that's up in the closet. And I know you've used some, some parts of it, but like, was that, do you ever look at that as like a waste or was it like, nope, this has helped me become a better writer? Like, no, I don't think, you know, this is one thing I do also try to tell my students. And, and even I had a friend one time, cause I, we were talking about journaling and she just didn't understand a journaling, mm-hmm. you know, cause it, that goes nowhere. I mean, you know, you're not, you're not going to publish it. No one's going to read it, you know, but there's a sort of freedom in there, in that, you know, mm. it's like, a, and the analogy that I love to use, I use it all the time is basketball. You know, when you watch a basketball game, a professional basketball game, those players know what they're 
doing. Mm -hmm. They look so beautiful. You know, they're communicating with each other. They're, you know, their skill level is really high. But what you're not seeing is just the hours and hours of drill work that they do that might be kind of, you know, it's not as exciting. It's, you know, maybe mind numbing or something repetitive, Mm -hmm. Uh, but all of that, you know, goes into strengthening their skill set. So um, I believe that about the book in the closet. I believe that, you know, it, it had something to teach me. Uh, you know, if, if anything, I did finish it. So it taught me with some perseverance because, you know, yeah. you, you got to have a lot of, you got to have a lot of perseverance. Um, but uh, I think it was, I think it was Robert Frost who said that, that, you know, um, 90% of what you write never gets seen by anybody. Mm. You know, you're just showing like the 10%. And I think he's right. <laughs> uh, wow. Yeah. Can I, I'll, I'll give you like 20%. Can I write a book called the book in the closet? I like that for a title. Sure. <laughs> maybe maybe 25%. I love it too. That's, yeah. I go for it. <laughs> Did you ever have your yeah. middle school students? <laughs> I wonder if you ever had your middle school students read your work. I would think so, probably, right? When you were actually teaching middle school. Well, um, I actually hadn't published anything when I was teaching okay. middle school. Okay. So uh actually my book. Um, Sophia Saints came out a year after I left the middle school. Mm. Um, but, you know, I've re-encountered a lot of students, you know, they've shown up at my readings. No, that's all, that's <laughs> I just had, this happened like about two years ago, I went to a school and I had a student, uh, uh, a former student of mine write me and say, I was your student at Horseman Middle School and you just talked to my daughter at her middle school, you know, and so uh. Uh, and there's a there's a, a group of about three or four of those middle school students that have kept in touch with me all these years. And, you know, so, yeah, so some, they're familiar with me now, but, um, but at the time uh, I, I, I hadn't published anything, but that said, I, I like to, I like to write with my students, you know, mm-hmm. and, and back in the day we had, um, you know, this was pre, you know, uh, ubiquitous computers. We had the overhead projector with mm-hmm. the little, with those little plastic, um, sheets that you know you would write mark and we would write you know we would write together you know and it would they were seeing it on the screen things being created and stuff mm. that was always fun <laughs> oh yeah oh yeah well i would love to talk about some of your more recent work um i've had the had the pleasure to to read lucky luna and coco and sing with me um are you luna <clears throat> are you 75 percent luna or i don't i guess yeah. is luna 75 percent you no, we're actually kind of different. Okay. Um, I think if uh, I get asked that a lot, like, you know, your characters, I, I think of, of all the books I've written, the character that, that uh, I have a lot in common with is uh, my main character um, from my book, Ask My Mood Ring, How I Feel. Mm-hmm. Um, her name is, uh, her nickname is Chia. <laughs> her name is Erica, but her nickname is Chia, like Chia Pet. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, cause she's the oldest in her family and I was the oldest and, and you kind of get tasked with a lot of parenting duties <laughs> mm-hmm. <laughs> when you're taking care of your siblings and things like that. Uh, but I am like Luna in a few ways. And, um, and so, you know, all these characters are born from, uh, you know, parts of your past. And, and there's two main things I, I feel like Luna and I have in common. One is, um, we have a lot of primas, so <laughs> we have a lot of cousins and, uh, and, and, and having to kind of grow up in close proximity with them. And, you know, your parents are like, you don't need friends because you've got all these cousins and, you know, and you like some of your cousins, but they also really get on your nerves. And, and there, there is a lot of competition between primas, you know, there's just a lot of competition. And, and that part of um, my childhood, I, I used to feed the story. Um, the other part of my childhood that, that kind of plays a, a role in Lucky Luna is my relationship to the Spanish language. So my parents um, are bilingual, but they, they grew up in a time when uh, bilingualism was not encouraged. Mm-hmm. You were actually punished if you spoke uh, another language in school. Uh, and they were really um, taught that the language of success uh, was English. And so <clears throat> when uh, they had children, they made the deliberate uh, choice to speak uh, only English to us. Uh, and, uh, and so, you know, that's, that's the language that we speak, but 
it has it had the sad consequence of making it very difficult for me to speak to my Spanish only grandfather, mm -hmm. you know, and we had a way of communicating. Uh, we could kind of get the message across to each other. But um, of course, I always think about what what stories I might've missed out on because yeah. we weren't on the same place. And Luna has that challenge with her, her grandmother, you know, and, and I think that it's not, a, it's not, you know, we're not the only ones as, as the book went out and I started talking to people, I, I met a lot of people that were in that same situation where mm. uh, I have some nephews right now, whose um, maternal grandparents are primarily Spanish speakers. They speak a little English, but they're primarily Spanish speakers and my nephews are primarily English speakers. And so it's still something that it's still a challenge, you right. know, crossing that language barrier. Right. Um, I wonder if you could maybe just give a couple sentence summary of the book since you did write it. Yeah. Luna is a story of a, of a girl who she has so many cousins. Uh, she can't even count them all. And uh, she gets in trouble very early on in the book. And she's forbidden from wearing hats. She loves to wear, she loves to wear hats. So the story is really about her kind of reconciling with having all these disparate cousins, you know, and also coming to peace with some insecurities that she has about herself, you know. And it has a it has a a very joyful ending. <laughs> mm -hmm. There's a lot of humor in it, you know, and um, it, it was it was so much fun to write. <laughs> Definitely, no, it's very it's very modern without being like you know, without having like Snapchat, like tw 20 times every page. And, you know, like mm -hmm. it, it was not clearly not trying too hard. It was really well done in that. Um, you talk about the hat. I mean, there's the motif of the hat is for every chapter title. There's, you know, there's the hat that um, along with the title. Uh, but very much like you were talking about, I guess it was Willa. How do you pronounce it? Willa K Cather? Uh, I, I don't know. I say Cather, sometimes Cather. I, I'm not okay. sure. <laughs> but you talked about but, yeah. how she was, I think you talked about how she was great at making like the, the places, the characters. Mm -hmm. And you definitely, you know, Corpus Christi, or, you know, Texas has definitely comes through as a character. Um, you know, Luna wants to wear boots all the time. And there's, was a boot scooting boogie. And yeah, know, <laughs> the, the, the country way of life. And, you know, along with the quinceaneras, they're playing they're playing you know maybe rancheras but they're also playing like hip-hop and they're playing you know pop yes and, right um and then you talked about the abuela you know those she has some uh some wisdom that kind of went over luna's head a little bit because of the language yes right? <laughs> um, now i used to love in my spanish class my my teacher would give us the modismos or the dichos of the of the week and the mm -hmm. one one of the few one of the six or seven that I remember is in una boca cerrada no entran las moscas. Yes. Uh -huh. Which leads her to what? Throw ants all over the place. <laughs> yeah, she has yes. One, the one cousin, the one cousin in particular who she does not get along with. Right. Right. Um, but I just, I thought it was just so well done that like you talked about your own Mexican American experience. Like it spans so many different Mexican American experiences. Right. We, we limit by just saying there's one, obviously. Right. right? Mm -hmm. I, I learned something new that, in Spanish, you, you're going to say there's a rabbit in the moon, not the man in the moon. Right. Yeah, there's a there's a that was a really fun um, part of uh, the story, because, uh, you know, in Mexico, they see a rabbit in uh. the moon. And um, and that's actually I was going to read a little excerpt. And that's kind of part of my excerpt. If, it, if this would be a good time to read it, I think we kind of got yeah nice we got done. like a natural segue to this there it is. so there it is. Nice. you know because i want to read from this chapter called la luna <laughs> okay. all right, all right. so i'll just read you a couple of pages here sounds good um it says luna means moon but it's also my name you might think it's weird to be named after something that hangs in the sky but lots of people in my family are named after things that hang in the sky my prima estrella's name means star Mirasol's name means look at the sun, and Celeste's name means sky, plain and simple. Then there's Paloma, whose name is Spanish for dove. Maybe doves don't hang in the sky, but they fly in it. So Paloma is a sky name too. I don't know what Claudia's name means in Spanish, but it sounds a lot like cloud when you say it. So that's what I think of when I say her name, clouds. Clouds that look like faces with giant noses. My parents didn't name me Luna on purpose. They did it by accident. This is because my mother is very superstitious. 
When you're superstitious, all kinds of things are bad luck. And the bad luck thing that gave me my name goes something like this. If a pregnant lady looks at the moon during a lunar eclipse, her child will be born with a giant birthmark that covers half her face. My mother knew about this bad luck thing. As soon as she got pregnant, all her sisters warned her, don't look at the moon. Guess what? She looked at the moon. I couldn't help it, she tells me. The moon was just so beautiful. Of course, she felt horrible when she looked at it. She didn't want her child to have a giant birthmark, so she begged the moon to forgive her, but she didn't really beg the moon. She really begged the rabbit in the moon. Yes, there's a rabbit in the moon. In the United States, people see a man in the moon, but in Mexico, they see a rabbit. I live in the U.S., but I live in the sparkling city by the sea, Corpus Christi, which is near the bottom of, Cor of Texas. A long time ago, Corpus Christi used to be part of Mexico. So we so see some things the Mexican way. Here's how to see the rabbit. Look at the dark spots in the full moon. The rabbit's body is curled over the edge. There's a giant spot where his head belongs and two long ears pointing to the center. So mom asked the rabbit in the moon to erase the birthmark from my face and the rabbit listened. I was born with 10 fingers and 10 toes and a beautiful birthmark free face. Mom was so grateful that she named me Luna to thank the moon. And because a bad luck thing didn't happen, she decided to call me Lucky Luna, even though it's not my official name. <laughs> so that's, a, that's how she gets her name. <laughs> I appreciate that. I, I love that line so much. I wrote it down, the one about, I live in the US. It just, it's just so much, you know, you, you know your audience obviously very well. It's, it's simple, but it says so much. It's very subtle. Just, uh, you know, a long time ago, Corpus Christi used to be part of Mexico. So we see some things the Mexican way. It just explains mm -hmm. things so in such a tidy way that it, uh, a younger person would totally understand, you know? Yes. Um, poliosis, is that the word? Yes. Where, where do you have do you have knowledge of that? I mean, uh, so that's what what Luna has, yeah. right? She she has like a like a streak of white hair, basically. She has a streak of white hair that she's very embarrassed about, and um, I just want to make sure. Yeah, that is what she has. And let me tell you, I was inspired by that when I was in middle school. There was a girl at my school that had this streak of white hair. Mm -hmm. <laughs> And, um, and so, you know, the kids kind of made fun of her and stuff. And so I, I kind of put that into the story. Um, but, you know, I was like, oh, you know, that's a birthmark and it has, it has a name, mm. but like Bonnie Raitt has that, you know, uh -huh. and, and, it's, you, and, the, and then I started like noticing, like, yeah, I do every now and then see somebody who has that mm. just like little streak of white hair. And, and I remember, um, reading uh catcher in the rye one of those books that i had to read in high school uh -huh. and uh, holton caulfield has a little has That's it right. too you know and so um you know it, it's not very common but it is it does some people have it and um and so she's very embarrassed by it and and that's why she she's very insecure and that's kind of one of the things that she has to to learn to make peace with you know and i i think one of the reasons i love writing for this age group is there's they're so self-conscious about things that, mm. you know, when you get older, you're like, eh, I don't care what, people, <laughs> I don't care what people think, you know, yeah. but when you're this age, everything is so heightened, oh, yeah. you know, it, it, if you have just like one little thing that, that might be considered like not beautiful or something, you kind of obsess about it. Mm. And, um, and it, it just becomes this big thing. And so I, I think a lot of growing up is really coming to peace with, you know, accepting who you are, you know, and all those things that make you unique. No doubt about it. Um, there's, there's a great writer named Reina Grande. Yes. Right. Uh -huh. um, I had the chance to, to get to know her when I was teaching in LA and when she used to live down there. And uh, so we were lucky enough to, we read her book, uh, Cross 100 Mountains, and she actually came uh -huh. and spoke to the students. It was awesome. And so we've been talking about it in class, you know, and there's a, there's a character named Sebastian Luna, and we're talking about Luna, you know, two sides of the moon, two faces to the world. And like the symbolism is just, you know, awesome. And then I basically asked her about that. And she's like, no, nah, I just like the name. <laughs> <laughs> all right, all right. But your Luna definitely has a, a significance behind it in that way. 
Mm-hmm. Yeah. She's just like, no, not really. In a nice way. <laughs> like, okay. Um, but you know, a lot of the, the, the comic relief, if you will, is the, is the misunderstanding of the, the dichos and that kind of thing. And, you know, one of them is the idea of, I guess, blood is thicker than water. Is that espresso? Mm-hmm. Is espresso thicker? Something like that. Thing? Sorry, can you hear me? What the grandmother tells her in Spanish, but the words, and so it's really my experience with Spanish. You know, when I'm speaking mm. to someone, um, there's just a lot, of, I have to use a lot of context clues. I have to look mm. at body language. I have to look at their facial expressions. And then what, you know, what are those, you know, one, two, if I'm lucky, three words that I know and <laughs> just kind of piece it together. Yeah. So she misinterprets a lot of what her grandmother says. Right. <laughs> but I but I do love how, you know, you bring that full circle without without giving away the ending. Um, you know, and uh yeah, the, you know, it's not it's not like a cheesy happy ending, which there's nothing wrong with a cheesy happy ending, but it's it's a very nice happy ending. It's very much in line with, you know, what what would have happened with those characters and and like you said the idea mm-hmm. of how much everything is heightened when you're younger and, and that could also include the love and the you know companionship of your family and the whole deal right my, my last question about that about lucky luna would be like did you have like do you have like a inferior middle grade and younger writing like do you have like a focus group like how do you know it's it's hitting home with the 12 year old the 14 year old you know I, I don't right now, you know, I have been, uh, when I was in San Antonio, I was in a, a writing group. They weren't, they were, we were all writing in different genres and they were mm. immensely helpful in my um, okay. development as a writer. Uh, but then when I left San Antonio, I, I, I didn't seek out another group. Um, but, <clears throat> you know, I do have young people in my life and, you know, you, I just hang out with them, <laughs> talk to them, you know, uh, they're growing up. So I'm going to have to like find another source of young people, but <laughs> you know, I'd have these young people in my life. Um, and I do, I visit schools. I was at a school Wednesday. I'm going to be at a school nice. on Monday. Okay. I visit uh, students that are the age of, of the characters I write, but mm. I really, I, I do get a lot of feedback uh, from people saying that my books do sound young they sound like the age I'm writing about mm-hmm. and that's that is a challenge for a lot of people breaking into the children's genre uh, they tend to write kind of like from a retrospective um, mm-hmm. viewpoint because that's you know that's their relationship to their own childhood and sometimes the books sound a little more adult than they should mm-hmm. um, and and you know when I when I was struggling with that what I decided to do, and a lot of my books are like this, I decided to write in present tense so that I could taking away some of that looking back aspect of the story oh, and trying okay. to make it more immediate. That's why so that's why so many of my books are so many of my children's books are present tense, you know. Mm. Um, that's how I got around that. But um, but yes, uh, I want to give a big thank you to um, my students over my 10 year career as a middle school teacher, because I had them write a lot and I read what they wrote and they really gave me an understanding and and a a kind of, you know, reacquaintance with uh, the thought processes, the emotional processes, the interests of of young people that age, you know, so. they're my true inspiration that, that's a simple thing but i really appreciate that it's really interesting writing in present tense how that really grounds the age the age group that mm-hmm. that's wow very interesting um apropos of nothing um mavericks or or spurs or none of the above spurs spurs all right there you go <laughs> there you go go pop and ginobili and tony parker and the great yeah all right that's great <laughs> I'm, I'm so interested in Coco. I mean, a modern classic of a movie, and you for sure did it justice. Um, how did you get involved in that? How did you get so lucky as to be able to write? Not lucky, obviously you earned it, you know what I mean? But but I'm sure you felt like, man, this is like a kid in a candy store. How did, how did, that, how did, how did that come about? That's an interesting story because uh, the, the Coco... Um, you know, in 2012, when Disney was going to do this film about Dia de los Muertos, they um, they applied for a trademark 
uh, for the title Dia de los Muertos. Mm -hmm. And I remember that. Yeah. And so there was a big, uh, it was a big controversy. There was a big protest. And, and one of the people that was kind of a leader of the protest was Lalo Alcaraz, who's a cartoonist right. for the LA Times. Mm -hmm. uh, and he created this uh, poster and, and it's Mickey Mouse, but he's skeletal. Yes. And he looks like Godzilla and, and it says Muerto Mouse. Mm. It's coming to take your cultura, you know. Oh. And so people started like making a lot of noise and saying you cannot trademark the name of a holiday that mm. predates Disney. You know, this mm. is wrong. And, and so Disney um, took a step back uh, and, and they realized that, um, you know, what they were trying to do was offensive to a lot of people. Uh, and, you know, Disney, I mean, it, they, they have a long history. And, and of course, I grew up with Disney. I love Disney. I watch all these Disney films, uh, but they do have a long history of doing um, cultural films without consulting people from that cultural. So it's a that culture. So it's a very Eurocentric view of these mm -hmm. cultures. Um, and so what they did was, um, you know, they said, well, if we're going to do a film about Dia de los Muertos in Mexico, we're going to go to Mexico. <laughs> I always call it a genius idea, even though it seems very obvious. But, you know, like I said, it, it's different than what they were usually doing. And uh, and I would say that that Moana and Coco are, are probably um, their, some of their first attempts at really involving people from the societies that they were representing. Mm -hmm. uh, and both of those films got very high reviews, very high reviews from the people that were being portrayed, you know? Mm -hmm. And so um, they hired um, a writer named Adrian Molina to do the screenplay. And all the actors are Latino voices. They even hired Lalo Alcaraz as a consultant, right. you know? So they hired their biggest critic as a consultant. Uh, and they, they, they tried their best to really capture, um, you know, the, the, the values and, and, and things like that. So when it came time for the books, because, you know, when Disney has a film, uh, they like to have books that accompany the film and they'll, they'll publish about four or five kind of starting with the board book, you know, mm. and then the pick that like the golden, um, what are those called? Those little golden books. Yeah. I think uh, kind of picture book. books. Uh -huh. Yes. The golden books, picture mm. books. And then they'll have like the, um, the early reader and, and the junior novelization, and then they'll have the novelization. So they'll do like, cause they want to, they want ch children at all reading levels to have mm -hmm. access. Um, when it came time for the books, um, the editor who was in charge of the project, um, she had taken a children's literature course when she was in college and they had read my book, Confetti Girl, ah. you know? And so, and so she, she thought about, of me, she just thought, I wonder if Diana Lopez would be interested in it. That's how it came about. They called oh. me and, um, you know, they, they, they asked me if I would be interested in it. They kind of gave me a, a kind of, they didn't want to give me too many details until I, <laughs> until I agreed, uh -huh. but they, they gave me a, a kind of a synopsis of the story and, it had music, it had family, you know, and, and I've always like, I've been, I, my books are very um, real world based, mm -hmm. um, but I've always been interested in writing books with, you know, uh, speculative elements, magical elements. And, mm -hmm. and I thought this would be a great way to kind of give myself practice. Like someone else has created the world, but you know, how do I, how do I do that? And mm -hmm. how do I write about that? How do I introduce these elements in, 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 a, mm -hmm. in a novel? Um, so that's how it came about. And uh, I was just so, I was, I had so much fun with that project. I can't I tell you. <laughs> I oh, man. Well, yeah. Thanks for, for reminding me of, the, I remember the history. Like I've, I've, I know who Lalo is through Gustavo Ariano and I know Lalo's done great work. I know he's right now, he's doing a lot about um, vaccine, you know, people getting vaccinated mm -hmm. with his cartoons and he worked with uh, the Casa Grande show and that's great. But yeah, I remember that. Right. So it, when it did come out, it was it was cultural appropriation. It was not. Yeah. I mean, the idea of, you know, of copywriting mm -hmm. that term and like, but I've forgotten that they did step back, like you said, and, and get it right, according to most, I think. Um, mm -hmm. And, you know, a beautiful film, a tearjerker. I mean, all of the above. And um, that's so cool that you got to work with it. Like I said, I bet it was just so yeah. much fun. <laughs> I wonder how much creative license you had because you know it does if you've seen the movie the book is you will you'll recognize the book for sure you you had the really interesting I don't know how many chapters 
but I, I say subplot, I don't mean sub as in subordinate, but like, mm-hmm. you know, I don't know the exact term, but you have a subplot with Coco, like flashbacks to her and her love of dance, which is so awesome. You know, how music was kind of bas- was basically outlawed in the family. How much creative license did you have for the book as a whole? And, and where did the Coco chapters come from? So, you know, my assignment, because most of the time when, you know, you have a film, you only have 90 to 120 minutes to tell the story. Uh, but, but, you know, novels, you have a lot more breathing room. Sure. And they actually told me, like, what we want you to do is we want you to adapt the screenplay, but we want you to expand the story. That's what okay. they told me. So they basically, they basically gave me permission to write bonus scenes, you know. Mm. And, um, you know, they didn't really tell me exactly how to expand the story. But I did have to, when I, they did want to know my ideas, you know, mm-hmm. so, you know, I read the screenplay a few times and, you know, and I thought, you know, I thought, well, this is called Coco and, uh, and she's very important, you know, she's what sets the story, you know, gets the story going, but she really disappears for almost all the middle of the story. I mean, she he's does. in the, yeah, Miguel's in the land of the dead and we don't, you know, and, and so, uh, so, you know, I said, I, I would like to tell Coco's story. I would like to imagine her story. Mm-hmm. Um, and the other thing that I did was um, realizing that the ancestors, you know, I just kind of look for whose stories are not being tapped as deeply as they could be. And, um, you know, Miguel uh, and Hector's stories were very well told in the film. They were very developed. So I really didn't touch uh, on their stories uh, I didn't do much different to their stories. I didn't really add to their stories too much, but mm. I felt like Mama Coco and the other character that I, I developed a, a lot more was Mama Imelda. Mm. And, and then just the, the aunts and uncles and, you know, Papa Julio that are, that are following Miguel, uh, tracking him in the land of the dead. I realized mm. they probably went to every place he went because they're tracking him mm. and we didn't get to see those scenes. So I added those scenes as well. So uh, I, I shared my ideas and, and I got a, uh, and they actually shared them with Adrian Molina, the screenwriter. He gave me a big thumbs up, you know, and uh, I had to do an outline and stuff, which is also very different than how I usually write. But, I bet. but yeah. um, it was, it was a different process. Uh, there was some collaboration, you know, but mostly they kind of gave me free reign and mm. they just had to approve it. And so I remember my, my first draft, they shared it with, um, Adrian Molina and he came back and he and he really liked it but he said I think I think you could go a little softer on my mind Melda I think <laughs> I think you'd be a little hard on her <laughs> they could soften her up a little bit you know <laughs> oh, so man. that's what I did <laughs> uh, so I love to talk to Adrian Molina I know I actually just was reading about him he's from he's from my area he's from Northern California up I think Yuba City or Yuba County or one of those so and I think he's fairly young, so he's got a lot more. He is. Training. He's right? very young. <laughs> right? Good for him. That's awesome. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, just, you know, such a, an incredible movie. I, I didn't get a chance this year in my Spanish classes to show it during the time um, for all, you know, various reasons. But, you know, it's it's one that will will stand the test of time. It's a, it's a great one. Um, I thought it was interesting, too. I, I don't know if I'm reading this correctly, but it seems like you... I mean, there's more about Miguel too. I mean, he's more, he's seen as really stubborn. Like we get that in the movie, mm-hmm. but like he's, um, you know, as my Italian grandma would say, I think it's the same in Spanish or close, like testa dura, right? He's like, I mean, he's, he's hard headed, he's stubborn. Mm-hmm. And, um, you know, family above all, family above all, that comes through a lot. And um, I wonder what you thought of Miguel. Did you feel like he needed some, some touches from the movie or was it just kind of like, this is so much fun. I just kind of went off on that tangent. Well, well, the main difference uh, between, well, it's not the main, but a big difference between uh, screenplays and novels Mm -hmm. is point of view. You know, so when you, when you look, when you're watching a screenplay, reading a screenplay, watching it, um, you know, unless there's overdubbing and sometimes there is, you know, there is at the beginning of the Coco film, but mm-hmm. you're pretty much the, the only way you know what the character's thinking is by looking at their facial expressions, their, their body language, just like in real life, we, we can't read each other's thoughts. We have to rely on those context clues mm-hmm. to figure out what uh, people are thinking, but we can't really read their thoughts. Sure. 
But this is the beauty of writing novels is that you can get into the minds of the characters. Uh, and so that part, you know, you know, I mean, it doesn't really tell you in the screen. It tells you what Miguel says. It might, it might give you what they call a Riley, you know, where it tells you like how he expresses himself, but it doesn't really tell you what he's thinking. And, uh, and so <clears throat> I had to kind of like imagine what he was thinking, you know, put mm -hmm. myself in his shoes. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and I really wanted him, you know, I really wanted him, his kind of like hurt at not being able to do the thing he loves, mm -hmm. but uh, you know, his conflict between he loves music and he loves his family. And why can't he have both? You right. know, right. I really wanted that to come through, uh, um, you know, when he was kind of processing what was happening to him. Yeah. So, um, yeah, I did play a little bit with that, just really trying to get inside of his mindset. Uh, you know, I had to do the book without watching the film because they were making the film at the same time, you know? Ah. So it wasn't, there was no film for me to watch. <laughs> mm -hmm. I just oh. had the screenplay and, um, and some concept art to work with. Mm -hmm. uh, so, um, you know, I was really nervous. Like when I was watching, when I was, first watched the film, I was really nervous because it's like, I hope I got it right. But, <laughs> mm -hmm. you know. Um, well, yeah, I was wondering about that. I mean, they're both published in 2017, right? Mm -hmm. So I was like, you know, maybe the book was written really quickly after, but I, I wasn't sure. Um, but yeah, I always love uh, parallel storylines. I mean, in a way, you could say that Coco, Mama Coco and, and Miguel's are, you know, they're, mm -hmm. you know, Mama Coco, unfortunately, you know, didn't get to follow through with her love of dance. You know, she was she was literally like hiding doing it. And Miguel was able to, you know, I think of like, uh, like Robert De Niro as like the young Vito Corleone, the Godfather, too, you know I mean? like, yeah. in, in like juxtapose with you know, mm -hmm. um, you know, future generations. And thank you for that family tree, by the way, that you uh, put in the book. <laughs> well, you know, when I was like I said, they gave me they gave me the screenplay, and there's all these tios and tias and primos and papa this and mama this and and I was like, how are all these people related? Yeah. So I actually asked, I actually asked them at Disney, like, do you have a, like, are you working from a family tree? Is there a family tree? Uh -huh. And, um, and they sent me a family tree and it actually has the dates, like with the characters are, are born and the dates that they died. And that true family tree was so helpful, you know, yes. it really helped me write the book. Um, and, and it was, um, I said, you know, this would be great for readers, you know, cause it is, there's a lot of people, a lot of characters. Mm -hmm. We should put this in the book. Uh, and they did, but it was uh, our graphic, you know, so I wrote the book, but the book des was designed by mm -hmm. um, Jenna Huerta who was the graphic designer for the book. She had the idea of putting the family tree at the beginning of the book and, the and at the end of the book, mm -hmm. you know, and so when some of the mysteries get solved and so, yeah, that was her idea uh -huh, and uh -huh. kudos to her. I think she did a great job with that. <laughs> oh, pulled it off. Yeah. Yeah. Especially because, you know, I mean, a lot of family sagas, it's just, you know, it's, it maybe goes from like, like three generations, but this is like what great, great grandma, you know, it's not, yeah. I mean, it's like, <laughs> wow. And you know, it's not, uh -huh. it's not a plot spoiler because people have seen the movie. Um, the beautiful, I think it's the exact last line that music has not torn them apart at all. Instead, it's the very mm -hmm. thing that brought them together. Yes. Uh, just like the movie, it's uh, it's going to induce those tears. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> Sing with me the story of Selena Quintanilla's last year. Was that was that post? Uh, was that during the pandemic when it came out? No, it's actually only been out since um, the summer. It came out. Uh, okay. It came out a few months ago. Uh, oh, actually, our um, our. Our hope was, you know, this year in April, Selena would have turned 50. Uh, and so uh, our hope was to have the book released. We, we were, our original release date was April 6th, uh, right before her, her birthday. And I kind of thought of it as like a birthday present mm -hmm. uh, to Selena. Um, but um, the, 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 the boat that was bringing it across the Pacific Ocean hit some bad weather. Oh, and the cargo container that had the entire print run fell into the ocean. <laughs> no, no way. No way. <laughs> yes. Oh my God. And so, you know, and so they were like, you know, I remember my agent calls me and she says, 
this has never happened to me before. Oh. I had already heard because because my husband, he he had ordered a book, uh, a mat, he likes to do close up magic and he had ordered a book that he had already found out uh, he wasn't going to get on time because the cargo container had fallen into the ocean. Jeez. And when she said, this has never happened before. And I go, did my book fall into the ocean? And she's like, how did you know? Uh, oh my <laughs> so but there was like this cargo container full of books that is at the bottom of the sea. <laughs> um, so we weren't able to release it until uh, July, but okay. it actually was okay because, um, you know, the schools were still closed uh, in, in the spring and, and they opened up this semester and, and I've been having a great time. Mm. Vi- uh, you know, I, one of my dreams with this book was that I would go around Corpus Christi, you know, Selena's hometown, and I would talk to students about her, you know, and I've gone to several schools that are in her neighborhood where she lived. Mm. And, you know, it, I think it's just extra special. They're learning about somebody who walked their streets, who ate at their restaurants, you know, who was in that environment. Hmm. Uh, and so it's, it's been a real, a real pleasure of mine to go talk to them about her. Yeah. Yeah. Tell me a little bit about her, <laughs> her continuing allure in, in Texas. I think, you know, there was, there's two things about Selena that I, I find very fascinating. The reason why I think she has such a strong appeal and, and such an enduring appeal and one of them, I, I think, is really captured in this illustration. I want to share this illustration from the book. And thank you to Teresa Martinez, the illustrator. She did a great job. She you did. know, she did. Um, I just, I, I, I don't get tired of looking at the picture she drew. It's this picture when um, Selena's a young uh. girl singing at her family's restaurant, mm-hmm. and it shows. Um, old people and young people, you know, people of all ages. And there was something about her music that, you know, because music's one of those, it's kind of like this generational thing, you know, you like you got mm-hmm. your parents had their music and you got your music and, you know, your kids are going to have their music, it, differences in people's taste in music. Um, but Selena, had her music appealed across you know, these groups. And they, and I feel like brought families together to go hear her, you know, brought families together. And so it was something that like, yeah, you could, and, and, and I get asked this a lot. I had never had the pleasure of seeing her in concert, unfortunately, uh, but right. yeah, you could go to a concert with your grandma. You're going to go hear Selena sing with your grandma. I mean, that's pretty cool. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, that was one reason why I think she has such a a broad appeal. But the other thing is, um, she always, uh, met her, you know, in her attitude and and grateful to her audience. And, uh, I've never met anybody that had anything, you know, everybody says she was so sweet, you know, Mm -hmm. she was just so nice and she, and she always remembered where she was from. And, um, I think that, you know, that that has been a, a, another really big part of her. The, the, just the community here in Corpus loves her, you know, and so uh, that's a big part of it. <laughs> yeah, you were talking about the uh, about the great uh, Teresa Martinez illustrations. There are like there are messages, like phrases and, and such, throughout you know many of the pages. Was that your idea, her idea, both? No, those were, that was her idea. And mm-hmm. so, you know, the, the, this is my first picture book. I had never written a picture book. Uh, and, and if you think a picture book's easier than a novel, think again, <laughs> because yeah. it's a whole, it's like a poem. Like, I mean, poems, people think, oh, a poem, it's short. It should be mm-hmm. easy. No, it's not. It's a, mm-hmm. it's a whole different genre. Um, and, when, and actually, when I, I first wrote the book, I overwrote it you know, because okay. I'm used to like not having illustrations. I'm used to having to use my words to describe. Um, and so, you know, my editor, you know, she's the one that kind of pointed out, you know, you, we, we're not going to, we're not going to include these lines because the illustration will carry that information, you know? Mm-hmm. And I thought, oh, well, that's true, you know? And so we were able to streamline the story, but the illustrations are very, very much her creations. She had my text as source material, but they are her creations. Mm-hmm. And um, 
and it really is a partnership between the writer and the illustrator, you know, uh, and, and they're, and, and they have the freedom to, the illustrators have the freedom to uh, interpret the story, make it come to life in the way that they want. Yeah. Uh, but there was there was some collaboration and, and the one um, spread that I uh, I like to share with people was uh, there's a page where Selena moves to Corpus Christi uh, for the first, you know, when she's 10 years old. And the very, very first um, draft of that illustration uh, did a great job of capturing the emotions that Selena might have felt, you know, but did not really uh, have enough Corpus Christi in it, you okay. know, and, okay. and I was like, I love my city. I imagine yeah. people all over the country, you know, a lot of people don't know about Corpus. I want more Corpus in it. Um, and so I just, I went downtown, I, I took pictures, I found some off the internet and, and um, you know, we, I sent them to um, the SI and, and she redid the, the spread and I love it because now it shows it shows corporate. We have these things called the L heads and the T head, and, you know, our bridge and, and our seawall. And, and, you know, it really uh, kind of captures the flavor of corpus. Mm. And, um, and so, but aside from that, I think uh, every single one of those illustrations is, is all of her. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You, 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 you do not have to weigh in. I've, I've, uh, I've heard, you know, the the mini series and stuff could be very controversial you know if for no other mm -hmm. reason than like oh it doesn't cover you know that's not corpus christi in the background and they don't have yes. those mountains and you know i guess that's the same <laughs> for every show right where it's like you know right you know. <laughs> um i wonder so i mean it's very family friendly for sure and, and and themes for children um you know about family and and love and determination and you know doing just being kind and being good to people i believe it's like it's, it's a note it's not part of the actual book is you know it's about the horrible fact that she was killed i wonder your decision making mm -hmm. on that on that you know to to include that at all you know where to include that i wonder how that came about you know uh, when i was writing the book you know uh, it's also my first biography it's a picture book biography and mm -hmm. so but I, I didn't want it to be a report, you know, and I kind of distinguish right. between like, there's a book, there's like a report on someone's life. And then there's like this biography. I had to kind of come up with a theme and I was so limited in the space that I had. And like I said, I overrode it at first, you know, I had to kind of really stream back. Uh, and so there's selection of detail, you know, and, and so I had to, you know, and, and I also an awareness that little kids are going to read the book. So, you know, I wanted to story to end on a high note. I didn't want it to end on, you know, on, on Selena's death, but uh, a lot of, a lot of Selena's story is her, you know, her death. And, and, and um, you know, I remember a lot of people, I mean, as I've been going around sharing the book, they're like, I remember, you know, mm -hmm. I remember when I heard that she died and everybody has like that story, like I remember. Mm -hmm. And, but I also, what I also remember was, how the community came together to mourn mm. and you know there were these candlelight vigils and even if you weren't uh, participating in one of the like formal events people just just with their friends with their family they were they were coming together to mourn and um and so you really can't tell selena's story without telling that part of the story right. you know and that's why i decided to include it in the in the author's note but, you know, but I also kind of include like what her legacy has been and, and then just how, you know, I mean, there's some interesting things that happened after she died, you know, that they did a commemorative issue. Um, I think, I don't know if it was Time or Newsweek, but one of those magazines did a commemorative issue that sold out within a week mm. and launched their Spanish edition, you know, like they realized that, mm. oh, there's this whole other market that we're not paying attention to and, and it launched a Spanish edition, you know, and uh, just, you know, things like that. And so um, that's why I included it, you know, but I also wanted to include uh, in the author's note, um, I, I will, because I knew young people were going to read it. I also wanted to talk a little bit about creative license, mm. you know, because it's a biography, but you also do some creative license. And I, I wanted to identify some of those places where I use some creative license, <laughs> <Yes>. you know, <laughs> I thought that was important. 
I wonder uh-huh. some of the I wonder some of the really meaning I'm sure all kinds of meaningful but meaningful feedback you've gotten on on Coco on Selena on the, on the books some of the the feedback that really stands out. What are some of the the, the feedbacks that I've gotten? Right, right. Uh, is that what you're asking? Right, yeah. Right. Um, I've had a lot of positive feedback, you know, but but my my favorite feedback is is you know are the comments I get from the children, mm-hmm. you know. Um, because they're the ones ultimately, you know, uh, they're the ones I'm writing for, you know, so if I, if I make a, a child, you know, I, I love when, the, you know, I love when a, a kid comes up to me and, you know, Miguel, it's Miguel Rivera, you know, and comes up to me and says, my last name is Rivera, you know, mm. it's not like, it's not like criticism or, you know, like critiques, like you're right. used to getting, right. but it's that connection, you mm. know. Or they, or they come, you know, and they'll be like, you know, the, they'll, they'll read the Selena book and they're like, my mom, uh, my mom sings bitty, bitty, bomb, bomb, you know? <laughs> and it's just like, uh, go, kind of goes all the way back to our beginning of our conversation about, you know, how important it is to have representation in the books. That is the, the most meaningful feedback that I receive. Mm-hmm. The other thing that, the other thing that I love to hear uh, I love to hear when, when parents let me know that they're reading this with their children. Oh yeah, I love to hear that. Uh, I think that that that's a powerful way of connecting to your child, and a meaningful way of connecting to your child. And you're just reading a book, and there's no test, and you know there's no assignment mm-hmm. attached. It's just you and your parents reading a book together, and maybe they're. I can picture them with their finger. Maybe they're helping the child read. Mm-hmm. You know, to me, that's a very that's very meaningful. <laughs> as good as it gets, right? Yes. Yeah. I wonder what uh, what else you're working what you're working on these days. What's next? Well, I have a book coming out in uh, in the spring of 2023. Okay. I'm back to the middle grade genre. Uh, but what I have done is, uh, you know, took the lessons I learned uh, from my Coco book, mm. and I'm finally getting to write my first book that has some magical elements. Nice. <laughs> I'm super excited. <laughs> uh, it's going to be published by Coquila Press, and I don't know what the final title is going to be. I, I'm playing with the title still, mm. um, but I'm just in my head. I'm calling it Los Monstros, and uh, and it's the story of, um, you know, I don't, I don't know if you know the legend of La Llorona. It, that's probably the most popular kind of border legend mm. but it's a story of a woman who um who's who drowned her children and um in my book uh, i imagine that one of the children has survived and so it's a story of that child and so i am having so much fun it takes place in a fictional town called tres leches tejas Ooh. which is halfway between corpus and the valley <laughs> and you know you know i i picked that name because I want to go to schools and I want them to give me a slice of this this cake. <laughs> so for but that's wedding. what I'm working on right now. Oh, uh-huh. Well, I was wondering how I was like, I was like, man, this is going to be a depressing book, but, but you made uh, but you have the, one of the, the children surviving. Okay. All right. Good. Because that can, yeah, be, yeah. That can be pretty, pretty dark for a, for a 12 year old, huh? It can be, you know, <laughs> but I, I love, I love to have humor in my stories, you uh-huh. know, and, and this story has a lot of adventure mm-hmm. uh, and uh, you know um, it's just, it's, it's been, uh, I'm just really loving it. I'm loving, I'm in the revision process, the final revision process right now. And, mm-hmm. you know, kind of revisiting some scenes I hadn't seen in a while. And I was like, yeah. Oh yeah, this is so much fun. <laughs> yeah. Well, well, thanks for saying you have fun. You know, so many writers and I get it. So many writers are just like, Oh, this is terrible. This is horrible. You know, it's like you know i know it's all you know a lot of tongue in cheek and they're obviously doing it for a reason but it's always cool to hear when people truly have fun with it um and what a great yeah what a great name for a city for for our wedding we tried probably three or four different places for the right tres leches cake and we yes found, you know it was great great research it was so good it was incredible i had probably this much of you know you know when you do the like smashing it in the mouth you know, yes <laughs> that, that's, that's how much i had of the cake for whatever reason we started <laughs> taking pictures so after all that i had about not even a bite of it but uh, you know, but, but great memories <laughs> uh well thank you so much i mean uh you know the greatest some of the greatest people in the world are are, are librarians for opening yes. uh you know opening up the world of books to 
to kids. And obviously somebody has to write those books and you've written some great ones. So thank you so much for sharing your process and, and the stories. And it was great talking to you. Thank you so much for having me. I've had a great time. As have I, and I wish you great luck in the future. Same to you. <laughs> thank you. Thanks so much for listening to episode 95 with Diana Lopez. You can now subscribe to the podcast on Apple Podcasts and leave a five-star review. You can also ask for it by name using Alexa and find it on Stitcher, Spotify, and Amazon Music. Follow me on Instagram where I'm at Chills at Will Podcast or on Twitter where I'm at Chills at Will PO1. And Diana, you are on Twitter and Instagram or just Twitter? Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook. And you can find me at Diana Lopez Books. Diana Lopez Books. Great website mm -hmm. as well. Yes. Mm -hmm. You can watch this and other episodes on YouTube. Please subscribe to the YouTube channel and to the Chills at Will podcast audio while you're checking out this episode. This is a passion project of mine, a DIY operation, and I'd love for your help in promoting what I'm convinced is a unique and spirited look at an often ignored art form. The intro song for the Chills Will podcast is Wind Down Instrumental, and the other song played on the episode was Hoops Instrumental by Matt Whitehour, and both songs are used through ArchesAudio.com. Please tune in for the next episode, which is a conversation with Frank A. Goridi. Frank A. Goridi specializes in sports history, urban history, and the history of American social movements. His recent book, The Sports Revolution, How Texas, where Deanna is from, of course, <laughs> changed the culture of American athletics and explores how Texas-based sports entrepreneurs and athletes from marginalized backgrounds transformed American sporting culture during the 60s and 70s. The episode with Frank Garidi will air on December 21st. For now, thanks again for listening, and I hope that these quarantine days bring you texts by writers with mad skills like Diana Lopez, whose work gives you chills at will.